Thank you for joining us for Brandon's Book Club. In this first video, we will be discussing Tress of the Emerald Sea, parts one through three, and we will just be discussing Tress specific. Um, so you can join us if Tress is your first book or you're not wider Cosmere aware. And then we will have a video at the end of the series of discussions where we'll be talking about wider Cosmere spoilers. So I'm Murphy from the channel Murphy Napier. Uh, I'm Lynn Buchanan. Um, I write adult fantasy and I have a book coming out next year from Harper Voyager. I'm Gabrielle, Chaotic Forager, and I study mushrooms and plants and yell about them on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ammon, ADHD Projects. I debunk Flat Earth and do 3D printing. I'm Bookborn from the YouTube channel Bookborn and I discuss all things fantasy and sci-fi. Awesome. So for Tress, one of the first things that I noticed and loved about it is the strong narrative voice. You know, we have the magic, we have the world, we have um, Gorf, Glorf, what was her real name? <laughs> Glorf, I think. Glorf. I think it was Glorf. Yeah. yeah, beautiful name, really lovely. I don't know why she doesn't use it, but Hoyd's voice for it all is really compelling and really unique thing that Sanderson did in this book. It's very funny. It's very like from the first page, when you read that first sentence, you already know. You already know what it's going to be. It's going to be a fairy tale. It's going to be whimsical. Yeah. And the humor was just, it's so fun. Like that's the word I thought when I first picked up this book was like, oh, this is fun. Yeah. yeah it has a very jovial tone yes. all the oh, way yeah. through, even when bad things are happening. Yes. Mm -hmm. I know Hoyd's his character, but he captured Hoyd's voice so well. <laughs> yeah, <he does. laughs> yep. And like the writing style for Tress in the Emerald Sea is so much different than anything else that he has written. It just, it feels like its own book. You don't yeah, have to come from his writing style to know how this story is being told. Yeah. And that was something that really excited me when I first started reading the book. I think I like lost my mind, honestly, when I read like the first page. I'm like, this is Hoyd and this is different and this is hilarious and I'm going to love this book. Like yeah, I knew so like goofy. from the beginning, I was like, this is going to be like one of the funnest books yeah. like ever. Yeah. And he does mention that Buttercup is a big inspiration, the mm. Princess Bride. Mm. And I think he does a good job of starting her in that kind of, I'm content where I am. I'm happy. I'm cool with like, let the, let the world take me, let everything kind of vibe. Um, and it was fun to see from that kind of that kind of character perspective. Mm -hmm. I, I like that um, Hoyd makes sure that you know she's not actually like other girls, mm -hmm. but she thinks that she's a normal girl and every other girl is unique, is unique <laughs> but she's just normal. Mm -hmm. And it's a way of showing that she is special in a way that she sees herself as normal. Mm -hmm. I think he does a good job of establishing that everybody is special and like there is no not like other mm -hmm. girls because mm -hmm. we're all just ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and and with the clear Princess Bride inspiration, I also liked how we introduced Tress and Charlie together mm -hmm. and how it's kind of a twist on how Princess Bride was right. mm -hmm. and how it feels typical, even though instead of the farmhand, he's the prince, but he's pretending. And so it's just, I like already, you know that, okay, this isn't the story that we know, right. which I think is really excellent too like to always i love a story that can take tropes i know and then turn them on their head which, which anderson's is, always yeah. good at yeah that's yeah. like this what he does book. yeah yeah, yeah. 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 And totally like when i was reading this book i was like okay this could work for like a young adult audience mm -hmm. but it also works really well for like an adult Absolutely. an adult fantasy audience oh, yeah. because it's just it's easy to read but it's also like there are some challenging moments in it. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's very light with still a lot of introspection. Yeah. I think something that the book does that kind of allows it to sit in that like in-between space is that it's very fairy tale-ish. Like it's mm -hmm. fairy tale-esque. And something I love about fairy tales is that they like originally they weren't written for children. They just kind of become 
like a more like children centric thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is like a fairy tale. So it appeals to children now because that's like the modern way that we think of fairy tales, but also like fairy tales were always for like adults too. Right. So like, yeah, I, that was something I loved about it as well. Just like the tone and just like how he runs with it mm -hmm. while making it Cosmere as mm -hmm. well, because it's very distinctly Cosmere, mm -hmm. even as it's like fairy tale and like in the fairy tale tradition that we have. Yeah, absolutely. And we do meet Huck really early on uh, when she does get on the ship and we meet our little rat companion. <laughs> I hate talking animals. So I was like, yeah. no Sanderson. Me but too. I thought it was really charming. Did you say you too? Yeah, me too. I am not a talking animal fan. Like as a kid, Redwall, nope, not for me. What? Don't, don't eat, I'm don't sorry. Don't say that on the internet. Oh, that hurts me. <laughs> say it, but don't say it. <laughs> so I was nervous, but I, I, you know, you can't help liking Huck. It was really easy to fall for him, yeah. Did yep. y'all have any first impressions of Huck? Of Huck? As a big like Cosmere fan, this was a whole new mm -hmm. realm of possibilities. And so it's, it, had to for me make sense in the world mm -hmm. and so he made it very sellable that this was a normal thing at least for huck the rat mm -hmm. no i agree i think he did a good job of kind of explaining it in the beginning that was like okay this is fantasy i see what you're saying mm -hmm. and then he just keeps getting to build on it which makes it more more and more grounded which is how sanderson handles like he has to explain everything to make it make <laughs> sense for us which is exactly what but you see, would want like, even in the beginning, I felt like there was this moment where it was like, we're, I'm presenting something to you that you're just going to have to accept for a little while. Yes. And Huck yeah. was definitely that for That's me. very true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, I felt that way as well. As much as I love, like, talking animal stuff like Redwall and stuff. It's like my childhood. <laughs> okay, I'm glad well, I'm that I have an ever. ally at this <laughs> table. Yeah. I was like, no, don't say that. <laughs> um, Huck did kind of throw me out because it's just so, it didn't feel like Cosmere to me when I first, like, when he started talking, I was like, oh. Like, it was a very much, like, our world, our kind of fairy tale thing. Mm -hmm. So as much as I love that this, like, pulled on, like, our kind of fairy tale tradition that did throw me out at first, I was like, oh, there's a talking rat in the Cosmere. <laughs> I'm like, but what's happening? He sells so. it to you, and I love it. Yeah, eventually, yeah. like, I came around to it. But at, at least at the beginning, I was kind of like, this uh, this makes it feel less Cosmere mm -hmm. to me. So. I think a big factor for me was that he introduced himself by saying, I was on my way to the rock. I have my reasons. I, can, I don't need to tell you. So like immediately yeah. I'm like, oh, okay, you're doing something, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't know what, but I yeah, knew to keep your coming. eyes on him, yeah. right? It and wasn't Huck just is like, like immediately animals. extremely charming. He was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was I mean, yeah. nibbling he's on the cork as he's like holding <laughs> yeah. on to it. It's like so cute. Yeah. 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 So I really specifically want to talk to you, chaotic, uh, chaotic forager. I almost called you sporager <laughs> about <laughs> the spores. <laughs> because the spores. Yes, yes. Once we get on the sea and we actually see how this works and um, how the seas move and everything, it's like I had to look up. Okay, what are spores? Like, what do they look like? What's the how mm. tangible is this really? And this is something that you're very familiar with. Yeah. So um, I love all things fungi and plants and. So I, I started reading this and it was really difficult for me to like turn off my science brain yeah. because I'm trying to like explain what's going on with what I know about like earth science mm -hmm. and this is Cosmere, like yes. it doesn't apply, but it made it really hard for me to figure out what to picture for a yeah. spore because when I picture spores, I'm picturing something that is, that you need a microscope to see. Unpicturable. <laughs> it's yeah. unpicturable um, unless you have some sort of magnification. So then I'm reading this book and I'm like, the spores are wait, we're comparing the spores to sand in the beginning. Okay, but like, as time goes on, I'm I'm not sure how big I should picture these. Yeah. And, well, oh, I was expecting fungi, mm -hmm. but then I see yeah. plants. And there are plants that produce spores. Right. Like, mm -hmm. um, like algae, um, some ferns produce spores, mm -hmm. um, and they reproduce that way. But immediately when we're talking about spores, I'm like, what are these things going to turn into? Like because the spore isn't usually like the end goal for an organism. Right. Um, and so then when we actually see what happens with these spores, I was like, oh, this is gonna be cool. This right. It's gonna be so yeah. cool. <laughs> right, the way they react to water and explode to life and everything like that. It, but then she's also picking them up and she's putting them in bags. So I'm like, okay, I don't, I was picturing something about that big, which is, yeah. what, what were you picturing? 
something similar to that. Were you? Um, I actually like what my head filled in was, have you ever seen like Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind? It's a Ghibli movie and there's spores in that. So that's just what I was picturing. And it's like, yeah, in that movie, there's lots of plants that like, have you seen it? Yes. Yeah. Like, you Beautiful. know, it's gorgeous. Yeah. Um, but yeah, these plants like produce these like toxic spores that are about this big and they like glow green and they like float around and stuff. So that's what I immediately pictured. Oh, that's so... I was like, fantasy spores ghibli um but yeah so that's just what i filled in and then like later i realized they like they're described as sand and that kind of threw me for a loop because yeah. i was like no i thought they were bigger and fluffy and they're not they're small and granular mm -hmm. um, what were you picturing uh i definitely like half the width of like a grain of um rice okay something something that's more tangible that you can see individual pieces but can still get that flowing motion in the the seas mm. yeah so I, I pictured at first that they could just get caught up in the wind and go wherever they want to, um, but they're a little bit heavier than that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they, he does kind of describe that bubbling up nature that we have yeah. already. If mm -hmm. you put water underneath sand, I know you air. It's our air. Air. Yeah, you blow air underneath the sand. Yes. That's what I was yeah. way more concerned with the fluidization. That's why I love talking to you because you're like I'm spores, and I was like, no science with the fluidization. <laughs> but I thought sand, and I think it's because of the fluidization. I was right. like, well, that's what you do it with. But I never even considered like. How did she pick out the individuals? I guess I just thought she was being very precise with the sand. So it's <laughs> really hard to imagine. And I yeah. don't know how the fluidization would work with thicker or bigger particles. Like, right. I'm kind of curious. Like, Yeah, because yeah. it does describe the churning and, and it bubbling up and hitting the sides. So I feel like the fluidization is a really good visual of what it should look like. And I think it's that's where the fantasy element comes in, right? right? Because I still imagined it kind of moving like a sea. And, of course, if you see the fluidization, it's not really like a sea it's much more quicker it's like yeah, yeah it's like royally or whatever so i think that's when we can kind of like use our imaginations you know? and scale is also important here because we're talking about you know not just a kiddie pool we're talking it's about true. an ocean <laughs> so, right yep. um, yeah. dealing with particles that are a little bit larger makes sense if you have a massive context for them true yes and the spores falling from the moons as well i feel like they have to be a little bit larger in order yeah. for us to see that um, but we did get the first scene where we actually got to see it all in action when they're shooting the cannonballs and the, the ships are mm. getting caught. And then there was, oh my goodness, the scene where Tress is walking. So stressful. Oh. <laughs> it's so stressful. Right, yep. right. Yeah. And it was so well done yeah. because he shows people like bleeding on it and then getting, you know, killed because of that or someone yeah. walking too fast. And he also describes mm. how like if a, sp like a verdant spore gets in you, like the vines will like grow out of your <laughs> eyes. And I'm just like... <laughs> She's yeah, gonna die. But it doesn't get into your brain, so you just yeah. suffocate. Yeah. You, you okay, thanks, Anderson. On. I have a new nightmare. <laughs> it's like actually horror, though. Like, I know. it's so like fairy tale, but when you stop and think about it, that scene is pure horror, yes. like walking across and. Yeah, sorry. I, I love fairy tales. Fairy tales are so dark. They That's are. Original That's fairy true. Tales. Yes. They really I are. read some of the yeah. grim fairy tales there. I had this yeah. like combination visual in my head of like, Imagining somebody walking across hot coals and like there's a specific speed you have mm -hmm. to go at so that you don't burn your feet. If you go too fast, you'll turn the coals over mm -hmm. and you'll burn yourself. If you go too slow, you'll be on them for too long. And um, imagining that with the spores is it's kind of interesting. Like, yeah, I thought something along the same thing in Dune. They, there's this giant worm mm -hmm. that lives underneath the sand mm -hmm. and they have to walk a specific way yeah. in order to not call that right. worm to them. And so yeah. I figured that there had to be some way that you had to walk across these spores to not kick them up into your, your face. Right, so well, like which, that. and that does happen while she's walking across the sea while it's solid somebody's walking too fast and he ends up kicking them up which just like adds so much more tension but she's also on a timeline because they could start churning at any moment yeah. or seething at any moment so it's oh, like yeah. it's very stressful he wrote the stress into that scene so oh, yeah. well mm -hmm. and it must mean that the spores are light enough that they are actually kicking up that high that's good because point. Yeah. like if you were walking across like a desert you're you're probably kicking sand but maybe it's going up to like your mm -hmm. knees mm -hmm. you know if it's going all the way up to your face like what are these spores? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it is interesting because when Tress first gets on the ship, she's afraid of how close the spores mm. are, even though there's silver around. And yet everybody else seems fine, but we know that they're actually afraid too. It's just the silver that keeps them a little bit content. Yeah. Mm. And it, like he writes the, that fear into everything so well. 
Yeah, but we finished this section with Tress hanging onto the ship and then pulling her up. What did y'all think about the, the crew members not mm -hmm. actually wanting to throw her overboard? Because I was like, why? That, like, that's convenient, <laughs> <laughs> you know? A little, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it does get explained later on, but yeah. But yeah, it's like, so she's now officially a part of this ship too, I guess. Mm -hmm. I feel like that moment is kind of a good foreshadowing moment almost mm -hmm. because like you said, it's kind of like, why wouldn't they just throw her over? But it's a nice moment of like, well, you're going to find out because they're good people, you yeah. know, like they don't actually want um, to kill people. And that's like a nice like foreshadowing for like more stuff that comes. Yes. Yeah. So. We dig into that a lot more in the later stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And we did meet Hoyd here as well. Yes. <laughs> which, you know, wider Cosmere, we won't go into right now, but I mean, it was so good seeing him in this narrator. disheveled yeah. space. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. He's a very beloved character, and but we don't actually see or hear a lot from him. Mm -hmm. And so this was like, it was very weird for me to be like, oh, this is just it. We get to hear an entire story from his perspective. Yeah. It's probably one of my favorite parts. Yeah, and the moments novel. where he's like self-referential yes, are this very welcome respite. It's yes. it's kind of like yeah. honestly in the Princess Bride where you go back to the grandfather and his son, and you're like, oh wait, a story's being told. Yeah, yeah. that's mm -hmm. what it feels like when Hoyd comes into the picture mm -hmm. and just like kind of reveals himself over the course of the book, mm -hmm. yeah. or interrupts himself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's like, quit interrupting me when no one. <laughs> when no one. Yeah. 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 Sorry, you were gonna say something. Um, when Hoyt first started showing up as an actual character, it was a little jarring for me. Oh, really? Because, well, because the narrator has been third person omniscient almost this entire time. And then when we go and then Hoyt shows up, he starts using I mm. for this character that's happening, but he's also narrating. So it was a little jarring for me at first, and I had to get used to that writing style. Um, but after, after I figured out how it flowed, because um, I, I read it at first out loud to my wife. Um, and so it was just hard to get that flow going from narrator to actual character and then yeah. back again. That was one of the first things I noticed about the book, too, is it's a very unique narration because you think at first maybe it's just kind of like a third person limited with Tress. But mm. it's really someone telling the story and then he shows up in the story. I don't know if I've ever read another book that has kind of like this first person, third person feel to it yeah he's which a side I liked. character yeah it was weird. A, in a story that he's telling mm. yeah yeah which means that there are parts of the story that he's telling secondhand and then other parts of the story that are being told firsthand mm -hmm. which is just wild when you mm -hmm. actually think about yeah. when you think about that yeah <laughs> you think too hard it's like wait wait right. know that? <laughs> yeah but it also shows a piece of honesty in his narration that he's genuinely embarrassed by himself but he mm. doesn't hold back like he does say i'm gonna go shove some shoelaces up my nose now <laughs> you know like he'll say it but he's like, yeah. don't, mm, let's not talk about that too long. I mean, that said, I totally don't trust him. <laughs> Honestly, like, I'm like, that's something I thought about a lot when I was reading Trust is like, how long, how much is Hoyd like changing this story? And that's like very meta. We're going into like layers on layers mm -hmm. of like storytelling here. But like, I do wonder like if Hoyd has like exaggerated parts of this story or I feel like, like he's so in love with stories though mm -hmm. that he would honor the sanctity of a story in the way that he tells it do you think maybe tell me go ahead <laughs> i don't know i do love Hoyt for the record um, <laughs> i do i also like think he's really arrogant and full of himself so to some degree i'm like he'll do whatever he wants to get his point across the way he wants it Interesting. like so i i trust him to do that um so I guess for me, I have this like inherent, like, I don't trust Hoyt all the time, personally. Oh, wow. And I know I'm the minority. I have such kind of bad <laughs> trust for him. Yeah, I'm like, no, I feel like Hoyt's going to betray me someday. You know, Lynn, I'm with but, you, though. So I yeah. love Hoyt, but part of the Cosmere is a lot of characters I love I don't necessarily think are good people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. that's part of it. But I agree. I think storytellers embellish a lot to make a story better. So mm -hmm. I think that's a very – I never thought of it, though. So now I'm going to be thinking, like, mm -hmm. how much mm -hmm. did Hoyt embellish to make a good story? Yeah. Yeah. Well, he recounts a lot of scenes that he doesn't participate in. So yeah. I assume he just – you know, listened. He just asked people for their accountings, mm -hmm. and then now he's retelling mm. those accountings. But yeah, I'm just like, I believe everything he says. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I did wonder how he could even know some of the scenes, you know, like in yeah. this book, which made me wonder if there's like another magic system I'm unaware of, like Ooh. going on mm. under the surface of all of this that we'll eventually find out with Hoyd. But it's just got many cameras weird everywhere. Things that I think about <laughs> with the narration. Yeah. So the introduction of these first 
three sections, these first three parts, uh, were you guys, were you pretty charmed right away? Were you in it or did it take you a little while? Oh yeah, for, for me, this has been one of my all time favorite reads for, uh, from not only Brandon, but all time. Yeah. Like it is, I, this, this is something that I will at least re reread once a year. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I was similarly him. charmed. Um, yeah. I think that the the characters are fun, but um, specifically the narration is what gets me. Yeah, I love the narration. Um, I think that uh, Hoyt is a, is a really fantastic person to be telling this story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, even if I, I will agree with you a little bit, I don't mm -hmm. like always trust him, but I think that he shows moments of something resembling humility in the story. Yeah. Um, and partially, I'm sure because he is a little ridiculous, <laughs> um, but but I, I really enjoyed the tone of the story. Mm -hmm. It's very different from what he normally does. Yeah. yeah what about I, you? I was totally, like from the beginning, I was in, like literally like the first sentence. I think really? I was like, yeah, this is gonna be my favorite. Yay. And it is. It's my favorite Cosmere book, like ever. Really? That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, it used to be Warbreaker and now Tress won. Uh, Warbreaker nice. is your favorite. Yeah. Yeah. Warbreaker is my favorite. I don't know if yeah. it speed it up, but it's up. Like it's I close. have to reorder the whole list. <laughs> yeah, now. right. Yeah. Exactly. Is it yeah. top five? Probably. It's yeah. hard to say, but I would say it's top five. I mean, the interesting thing is, I think probably most of us. Like I forgot that I was going to get the digital copy on January first. Like mm -hmm. I kept being like, oh, it's delayed, and then it's just on my phone. And to start the year off with this book was was a good moment for me. Like mm -hmm. just. The, the hopefulness and the tone, it was, I think the same thing. It was immediately like, okay, this is going to be a favorite. Like, I didn't mm -hmm. need to finish it to know that it was going to be a favorite. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm a huge fan of fairy tales, much <laughs> like you've said. Yeah. Read a lot. Peter Pan is my all-time mm -hmm. favorite book. Yeah, yeah so the, the whimsy of it all. And mm -hmm. Sanderson's such a hard magic system writer mm -hmm. that to see him just kind of, like, let go and yeah. let it be. Super satisfying. Yeah, that <laughs> yeah. level of whimsy. I was like, I want to see this from Sanderson. I want to see how he does this. And I was not disappointed. It was so much fun. I think it really yeah. says something about Sanderson's magic system that a book like this can exist within that context. Mm -hmm. Yes. And mm -hmm. it says a lot about him as a writer, too, because he really played with his prose in this one. Mm -hmm. And I've been quite open. I'm not a huge fan of Sanderson's prose. I love his uh -huh. storytelling. I love his characters. I love his magic. But his prose, I'm not like always in line with and he played with his pros and he really did something different that i think was so successful at least for me as a reader i felt the oh, yeah. freedom in the secret projects yeah. i always expected the secret projects to be a little freer because of mm -hmm. the way they were you know conceived but this was like okay i i felt it it was mm -hmm. like you were felt free to just do something new and that's why i think it's so joyful mm -hmm. and it works so well mm -hmm. yeah you can tell that this was a passion project just something mm -hmm. that he wanted to get lost in yeah. and then decided to share with us. Yeah. But I'm really glad he did. And this is one that he specifically wrote for his wife. Yes. Like he, he wrote it as a gift to her. Yes. And then she, Emily came out and said, you need to share this yeah. with everyone. And so I, I like that it's, it's passionate because it is written for her Yeah. and mm -hmm. that we get to experience it with them. Yeah, absolutely. So digging more into characters specifically, obviously we can start with Tress. Do you did you have any first impressions of her book born? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I did kind of fall in love with her right away. I think the, he did walk the really good line. We touched on this earlier of like, not like other girls, but she's not that way. Right. And I think it was, I liked how he played around with that idea. Right. And um, the whole mug idea, I have a collection of mugs. So I was very enchanted that someone else felt the value in a good, a good cup. Mm -hmm. um, and so I liked that. And um, just, you know, you could tell that she was going to be a force in her story. I mean, I guess we yeah. could assume that. But I liked how you already saw the under opinions of that character part of her yeah and you even see a lot of growth in her just in these first three sections yes. of not wanting to be a bother and really being content and then realizing oh only one person cares about charlie right now and it's me mm -hmm. so i guess i have to do this and it was just kind of a matter of fact decision that she mm -hmm. came to um yeah yeah and that's something i love about her i like i have not related to any character ever as much as i related to Tress. <laughs> honestly i think there's a couple reasons for that 
the hair is the obvious one. I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was like, look. Um, but also, she's like a total stick in the mud, and I love it. Like she's, <laughs> she is like just so grounded and so practical. And I have been called like a stick in the mud and like oh, no, no fun like my entire life, honestly. So when I read, it, I was like, finally, a character <laughs> who's just sensible. Who does sensible, sensible things, you know. Um, but so often sensible characters are written as passionless, and that's yes. not her, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. She walks this beautiful line between practicality and passion yeah. that feels so true to life. Yeah, like, just because you're grounded doesn't mean you're boring. And I think that's, like, something that, like, comes across in the book a lot. Like, there's multiple discussions about that. Mm-hmm. And I just love that. Like, it just Yeah, like, sometimes me. being practical <laughs> just means that you're, like, smart. <laughs> and you're, like, <laughs> trying to make yeah. decisions. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And Hoyt... <laughs> emphasizes that in this section Mm -hmm. of the story where he's like find a hero no problem but find somebody that'll think for a second does something that's a storyteller's dream (laughs) yeah Yeah. exactly yeah so i just loved her because of that and also it's very like her collection is also very charming i mean i collect things i think everyone collects something right so it's it's a very relatable quality and it was something it was just one of those quirks in her character that was just super lovable for me Mm -hmm. as well and the fact that she likes cups that are like beat up Mm-hmm. And like not even nice usually was also just very endearing. I'm yeah. like, yes. And she calls on Charlie to give her stories about that. Yes, it's and so that's also sweet. very sweet. Yeah, it's very. She sweet. likes the story in it, and she lets someone else tell the story. Because that... it's not about mm-hmm. the cups; it's yeah. about the connection that she mm-hmm. gets through the cups, which is so sweet. Mm-hmm. And I think most of us who collect things feel that way. Like yeah. we, we it's the put a lot of it. like sentimentality onto onto the objects and yeah. personify them in some way yeah, yeah. that's very true mm-hmm. um, one thing that stands out to me with her is we talked about this a little bit earlier her parents mm-hmm. she has she has parents for one mm-hmm. and she consults <laughs> them for two those are two very big um trope breakers in this yes. story she mm-hmm. has both her parents are alive and they're supportive mm-hmm. and she makes them food Mm-hmm. Yeah, and she thinks about them, and they mm-hmm. want to help her, and like, yeah. yeah, they like. She asks for their advice, and they give good advice, mm-hmm. and they actually like help her. I there's like a line I can't remember exactly, but like essentially, she's like, "You probably think I'm crazy for like wanting to go after Charlie," and they're like, "No, we think you can do whatever." Yeah, like you mm-hmm. set your mind to. We're a little scared, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I really love that. Like, um, I just feel like it's a very good like like you were saying, like a break from the tropes of like mm-hmm. hateful, mean parents who like don't support you, which is kind of what Charlie has. Mm-hmm. Um, right. <laughs> so yeah, so we still get a taste of it uh-huh. without it being, yeah. yeah. Well, it's just, I think a lot of times it can be just laziness of, uh, I need this teenager to go on an adventure. No parents. Yeah. yeah. Yep. That'll it, make yeah. it happen. It's like a totally, like, yeah, like I've thought about this from like the writing side of things because sometimes you want your character to make independent decisions. So mm-hmm. if they are a teenager, it's hard. Because they're like you, like normal teenagers or most teenagers, I guess I should say, have parents or parent figures in their lives, mm-hmm. but that tends to like restrict what they can do. So it's understandable why you want to kind of like cut the parents out. Or like, but she is eighteen when she yeah. sets sail. She's, so she's seventeen like, yeah, at the beginning, adult. but then yeah, a yeah. year passes yeah. before she actually yeah. goes. So, so that helps as well. That does help um, a lot. Mm-hmm. What about the? Sorry, I was here. just say one of my favorite things is the father character. He gets so much character in such a short amount of time, and. I would have to find the line, but when he's like, and then the father went out and did what good fathers do, and he goes, uh-huh. and there's that advanced scene. Advanced yeah. fathering or something. Oh, advanced yeah. fathering. Yeah, yeah that fathering. is what it is. Yeah. Advanced fathering, and, and how great. he goes and kind of collects favors for her. I just, I found that moment very sweet. I was very mm-hmm. connected to that. Yeah. yeah. What about the dynamics between the two? Did you kind of vibe with their romance? I didn't believe the romance at first. And I think <laughs> because um, I really had it in my head that this character is practical above all else. Um, I believed it more when Charlie was kidnapped. Oh, yeah. And sh- the way that she reacted, and she just sprung into action. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had, like, some theories at that point about how the story would end yeah. that, mm. you know, may or may not be correct. But <laughs> we'll talk about that. <laughs> yeah. So I looked at this, and I'm like, is this going to be, like, a coming of age and also learning to be independent kind of story? Sure. Um, you know, is she going to go through all this work and then find out that like, oh, actually, like I slayed the dragon, but I don't want the prince. That was me. That was what I was hoping for. Like, (laughs) like no spoilers of what goes, but I was like, this is the ending I want. (laughs) Did, what did you think about the romance? That's, uh, I thought the same thing is that it was a very 
it was a young romance that yeah. like teens get in while they're in high school and then when they grow up and find themselves they realize that that wasn't quite mm -hmm. what they wanted and especially as we see tress grow from this girl on, on a little island to a, a pirate like you you see that's a lot of growth in a little amount of time that when you get to re-meet with the the person that you fell in love with you're a very different person exactly yeah, yeah absolutely and i'm heartless so i was just like <laughs> right. Well, right yeah. exactly right <laughs> go on your adventure don't return to the rock you know and but i think too also we've been conditioned to just not mm. trust a romance at the beginning right because like they will break up She'll find someone new. Like, that's just the that's way things the are. And that's, yeah, yeah, the story began with a romance. So I think we're just conditioned to be like, yeah. okay, and what? <laughs> yeah. And I had a similar reaction where I figured, like, kind of what everyone's been saying, like, her character growth will make it so that she couldn't be with Charlie or something or whatever. Mm -hmm. That was, like, my initial reaction when I was reading. And I was really hoping that wouldn't happen, though, mm -hmm. because I would, because it's the thing I was expecting, yeah. <laughs> if that makes sense. I was like, I hope this, like, bucks my expectations sure like because and part of it is because of tress herself i'm like she's so like in herself like she knows who she is mm -hmm. sort of thing so i think when i first read like this first section of the book i was like well i see where this is probably going but i kind of hope that she gets to the end and is like wait i can make my own choices and i can think about this differently you know like just mm -hmm. i was kind of hoping for that but yeah i had similar reactions though like yeah this is probably like the direction i think something that's unique about her character is that she starts out a confident person yeah which i really like yeah uh, especially nice. with women it's really easy to start out with oh this character doesn't, she doesn't know herself mm -hmm. she um you know she doesn't um she literally lives on a rock instead of under it the <laughs> yeah, yeah. um and she really is like very self-assured for mm -hmm. somebody who yeah. doesn't have a whole lot of life experiences. Yeah. yeah, so she already knows herself. So I think that's why I was like, I hope at the end it isn't like she's a completely different person because I like who she is yeah. already, yeah. you know? So. But I like that even though but. she knows herself really well, mm -hmm. that she still encounters so much change because her life yeah. is changing. Yeah, and that's realistic. You yes. know, I feel like books sometimes will like make it seem like you have one moment in your life where you have this crazy and you like learn who you are like in a flash sort of thing and at least from my experience in life that isn't how it is like it's right. more like a slow build up and it kind of continues your entire life you're yeah. like you get layers and that's kind of how i feel like tress was like she gets layers yeah. as the book goes on rather than like completely changing that's very but. true yeah it's not even so much a coming of age as it's just an adventure and as you experience the world more your worldview shifts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about crew members? I'm really curious who everybody initially latched on to. Because for me, it was Fort. Same. Fort. I was like, yep. really? Yeah. Yes, everybody like, yep. Fort. Fort. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Oh, wow. He's okay. such an endearing character. He's so endearing. Well, and yeah. he's got the tablet, right? Which is like very Cosmary. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. Also, has that needs right? to be real. Somebody yeah. make that real. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I don't think we're too far away from something no. similar yeah. to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I actually, two of my good friends growing up were deaf and mm -hmm. I learned sign language through it. So I, I mean, I'm come to expect Sanderson to do research, but the fact that he took a moment to say, I know you would expect him to read lips. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that for a second. Mm -hmm. And that was actually like, oh, thank you for taking a second to talk about this because this is actually a real a real issue that hearing people don't realize that there's mm -hmm. such a big barrier there mm. what well, what was your favorite part about or what latched you onto him for me it was the same i i um have lived with several deaf people in the past um so i also know sign language um but it's it's that that he does his research that i, I love that he talks about lip reading mm -hmm. that it's not it's not accurate at all mm -hmm. and so he has a way of getting around that because Fort One doesn't have a lot of dexterity for sign language mm -hmm. and no one else knows it. So there has to be some other way to get around that. There's this magical tablet. Right. Um, and I like that it it shows the audience something that they didn't may not have known about deaf people in our world. Right. Which fantasy is always a um a, a mirror of our own world. Mm -hmm. And so we can see ourselves in that world. And so for Fort there we can learn something about our world is that a lot of deaf people they aren't as easy to communicate with as we would think yeah and with um with so many um devices that are existing that exist in this world for deaf people they're made mm. for the benefit of hearing people sure. and fort's device is so clearly for his own benefit 
most of all. Yeah. Um, like, mm -hmm. could he find another way to communicate with people? Like, mm -hmm. sure. But the the fact that it is it is there for his benefit mm -hmm. is is really cool. It seems like the sort of thing that a deaf person would want for themselves, that they would like make for themselves. Mm -hmm. I was gonna say, I like that he made deals, like these exchanges oh. um, was a huge part of his personality oh, yeah. that I really well, attached to. Yes, and yes. his culture and w the expectations of what a good deal is and what's a good deal to him or someone else. And it's really about the exchange between the two people. I just really liked that idea. It was, I really, that's what attached me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, even just the way he does conversations, how he's, yes. she's like, just talk to me like a friend. He's like, no, this is the fun part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I want to do this. And, yeah. and that she just embraces it. She's like, okay, well, if this is how you do relationships, then this is how we'll do relationships. It, it's, it's a greater theme for all the characters really in Tess, yeah. I feel like, which is we all have that weird thing about us. And we all have that thing that excites us. And this is the best part, you know, for Charlie, it's talking on and on and on. And for Tress, it's the, you know, the broken part of the cup or whatever. And for him, it's the exchange and yeah. how you see all those characters react and go together with those uniqueness. Like, I just really liked that as an overarching theme mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. all the characters. Yeah, no, I completely yeah. agree. And I think like you kind of touched on, it's, it's a lot of what makes you unique or what a lot of people see as a deficit in you is just a piece of you. So, you know, I'll just learn to, to love you like, like mm -hmm. this. Yeah. And it's, Really, really sweet. Even the way they treat Anne yeah. with her fixation with, with her. guns, yeah. and they're like, "No, nope. yeah. <laughs> yep. yeah, yeah." And even with the doctor, Ulam, yes, Ulam, yeah. yeah, they accept him, yeah, <laughs> which yep. is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even though, even when he's trying to get your eyeballs from yep. you, they just roll with it. Uh, I'll, I'll give you one to replace it. <laughs> yeah. That was like such a Terry Pratchett moment for me. Oh yes. absolutely. Yes. I see that. Mm -hmm. That's so fun though. But like, if you've read more Cosmere books, then Ulan is mm. just that much more charming because you can yeah. make those connections. Mm -hmm. And oh. they, he makes it so obvious without it being a, a stumbling block for anybody. Mm. Yeah. I will say when I first read the book, I did not connect the dots on oh, what- Oh, really? Oh, really? I felt so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I figured it out eventually, <laughs> um, but it took me a while. It took me longer than it probably should have. So did um, you just think that Ulan was just some really weird person asking for eyeballs? No, I thought he was like a legit zombie or something. <laughs> like, I was like, this is a... So, uh, First yeah. talking rats, that's what I now it's zombies. zombies. <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of like, yeah. Looking back, I don't know how it took me so long. Yeah. <laughs> like, honestly, I'm like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> but yeah, I did have that moment at first. I was like, wait. And I think it might have been how he's described, like like ashen or something or like like he's because it's just not the image i have in my head sure mm -hmm. sort of thing i think that's what threw me i was like wait he's like green ish mm -hmm. yeah i was like he's a zombie yeah, yeah that makes sense yeah i am curious i'd love to hear everybody's like top scene or moment mm -hmm. and then maybe the thing that they were not sold on here at the beginning in these first three sections you're thinking lynn do you know uh, off the top of your head i'll, I'll go <laughs> her walking across the spore oh, sea yeah top moment for me impeccable <laughs> and least favorite for me was huck him being on his way to the rock and being captured and now he's going to be a companion i was like well that's mighty convenient you know i was yeah. like well you're gonna have to you're gonna have to prove yourself on me prove yourself to me on this one sanderson mm -hmm. I can go next. Okay, yeah. um, honestly, I think my favorite scene was also Tress crossing the spores. Um, it's just so intense. Mm. Like, it just, like, and it helps that there's an illustration <laughs> in the book. I'm like, oh, yes, I'm so glad we did that one. Gorgeous um, illustration. It's perfect, yeah. That's my favorite illustration in the book. Mm. Yeah. It's so pretty. It's just so creepy, that moment, because we know that the spores can, like, burst out of your orifices <laughs> um, if you if they get into you and stuff, and... It's just so intense, and I just loved it. Um, I'm also kind of a horror person. So <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Mm, mm. <laughs> so when the other guy died, I was like, sweet. <laughs> I was like, look at that. Um, and my least favorite part. Um, I also kind of raised an eyebrow mm -hmm. at Huck a bit. Uh, we talked about this earlier, just kind of like, oh, this doesn't quite feel like it fits in the Cosmere. So I did have that kind of like, I almost like flagged it in my head a little bit to be like, hmm, to think back. But I do have one very stupid thing that... <laughs> I love petty complaints. Give me your petty complaints. <laughs> that like bothered me. Tress has curly hair. <laughs> she has very curly hair, apparently. 
And she gets up in the morning and she brushes that curly hair when it's dry. And as a curly haired person, you do not do that. No. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, Thank I, you. You can back me up on this. Yes. Yeah. It's like, unless you want your hair to just be frizz. And I like give it some allowance because she ties her hair that's back. What I was about to say. Yes. Yeah, so that's the only reason she I braids like, it. So it's like, mm, it's a little bit. <laughs> like, is she, is she like bathing in the morning? Because if yeah. so, I'll, I'll accept that. But if she's, if she's brushing it dry. She like, is though. It's, no. Yeah, it's there dry. This is in the book when she's on the ship and she's, and she's brushing, brushing it dry. It dry. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And that's painful. Like if Sanderson. you do it, like it's just painful straight up. So I'm like, yeah, no, no, <laughs> like, not, not, not the hair. Uh, that's my petty complaint. Do you have I, a petty, I, I want everybody's problem. complaints to be petty. Oh no. <laughs> that bothered me too, because I was like, as a curly haired person, like, did all of our moms, like, curly-haired kids, like, did all of our moms just, like, brush our hair? <laughs> my mom has straight hair, so she would brush my hair, and I would just yeah, look like a topiary. My, my mom has curly hair. She would brush her hair. I'm not sure why. <laughs> like, in hindsight, I'm like, why did she do that? I think we pulled it back, like, Tress. Okay. Like, my yeah. mom would pull our hair back, and, and then you can brush it, really. But it's painful still, and it's not comfortable. Mm -hmm. and, I always had the braids and yeah. everything because, like, my mom couldn't like mm -hmm. manage it otherwise and it would get really frizzy and matted but yeah but yeah that was a moment where i was like uh -huh. sanderson doesn't <laughs> have curly hair otherwise he wouldn't know yeah. what about favorite moment my favorite moment was actually getting the payoff of figuring out how the spores worked yes mm -hmm. that was that was like mm -hmm. ah okay yeah now i can kind of like picture what's going on mm -hmm. um and it was like so eldritch and cool <laughs> how it works and, mm -hmm. creepy. and so, yeah. creepy. Yeah. so creepy so <laughs> creepy yeah, and the way Hoyt explains it by breaking the fourth wall and just being like, all right, I know you're curious. So I'm yeah. like, just gonna do Yes, this. we are. Yes. <laughs> so I'll just tell you. Yeah. Uh, so my favorite part is, so it goes with her walking across the spores, but it's not just that. It's when she flicks a little bit of spit on the ground to make the vine grow right. up. Mm. It, it shows a willingness in Tress to utilize the spores in a way that would have scared her a day ago. Um, she she would have never walked onto the spores when she was on the rock, and she definitely would have never tried to use spit if she hadn't used or seen the yeah. the roseite being used in a specific way. Right. She learned mm -hmm. that these are Already learning. tools, mm -hmm. so she's she's willing to utilize what's around her. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and that's a huge piece of her character, even throughout the entire book, is just her perception and understanding and willingness to learn and adapt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Least favorite? Did you have one? Um, uh, I don't know. This it's hard for me to choose least favorite because um, there's so many. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, terrible. Um, no, because I, I liked it so much. I I get lost in the world of the fantasy. So even my the hardest part that I had was a talking rat. Sure. And it just was so jarring in the world the worlds that he has created. Yeah. Um, so it, it took me a while to warm up to Huck as as a rat and that it exists. And I just have to accept that for now. Right. So. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Well, I think everyone talked about that one scene enough. So I'm going to choose like a different favorite moment. I have a couple lines. Um, one is when uh, Ch Charlie in the beginning tells her, you're like a pair of gloves. And then yeah. it says that she chokes up. It was just such an interesting moment. Like, I just loved that moment so much because you had heard her thing about how he's a pair of gloves and then for him to repeat that to her unknowingly, mm -hmm. I actually thought was sweet and I'm also heartless. Oh, yeah. So generally <laughs> I hate stuff like that, but I kind of was like, okay, I like it that. It was sweet. Um, and then I think it's at the very end actually of this section where she gets onto the boat and they want to throw her off or Crow does. Yeah. And she just starts scrubbing the deck. I really related to that. Like if there's something I can do, I can clean something. So like, just let me prove to you I could keep this really clean mm -hmm. just her willingness to just be like well i don't have a lot of you know skills in this situation but i i can clean the deck you know like the humility there yeah i just really liked that character moment for her mm -hmm. uh, my least favorite is the same as everyone the talking rat it was really <laughs> difficult. it was really difficult for me in the beginning to deal with that cosmic mm -hmm. in fact i actually did a little Google, like, am I forgetting something that happened in, like, a Never novella? Never Google while you're still actively reading. It was January 1st. <laughs> oh, okay. There's no oh, way there was yeah. going to be a trust yeah, spoiler. Do you know insane. what I mean? So yeah. I was like, am I forgetting, like, in one of the novellas that I haven't read in a while? And so, like, I'm Googling. I'm like, nope, okay. This is the first talking rat. So, yeah, it did take a Sanderson's moment. Sanderson's going off the rails. Yeah, it's still <laughs> happening. I'm curious. I'll be interested to read the comments on this and see if everybody else is like, it was fine, guys. Cool. Right. With the rat. <laughs> <laughs> or if that was kind of a common complaint. Mm -hmm. um, 
So wrapping up talking about characters, we have to talk about the Dugs. Bookborn, I know that's like your favorite. <laughs> Some of my favorite parts. I thought that was so funny. I don't care. It's so simple. And it's like, no, we're just going to call every character Doug. As somebody who, first of all, cannot pronounce a name in a fantasy book <laughs> and two, can't remember a lot of the names in a fantasy book, this was great. It was what, perfect. This was built for me. Thank mm -hmm. you, Brandon. Like, I felt it. I also felt like Sanderson was kind of making fun of himself a little bit. <laughs> it's like his character names. I love his books, but his character names are ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Unpronounceable. So yeah. just calling everybody That's Doug, better. like, mm -hmm. yes. And it's so Hoyd. Like, if Hoyd's going <laughs> to say, yep. you yeah. don't need to remember these names, then he's going to do it like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love how he, like, segues into, like, we're going to call everyone Doug, because every society has Dougs. Like, <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, like, just literally every yeah. culture. Yeah. 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 That was great. I was like, oh, yep, Doug. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I, I like that it's something so easily that I can put into my own vernacular. Because, like, if I try and use storms in my everyday life, everyone's going to look at me weird. But if I can say, like, a random Doug, <laughs> people, <laughs> even if they haven't read this, will know that I just mean some random person. Sure. Yes. I, I love that uh. it's something that we can relate to and, and utilize. Yeah. yeah. I will say, like, the name Doug in the Cosmere does throw me a little... <laughs> just a little like I was, cause, because this isn't how he usually names his character that's like another yeah. Pratchett moment yeah. for me yeah, so where it's, it's like this feels, yeah. this feels earthy yeah it feels a little, a little earthy but it didn't bother me in this case because I just think it's hilarious so I was like yeah Doug's we're going there's with a it. lot of self-referential moments yeah. like that throughout Tress that we'll get to talk about later oh, yeah. that mm -hmm. I think it makes it very fun well thank you Doug's for the discussion <laughs> on 133 and thank you Doug's for joining <laughs> us um, this is for parts 133 next week week we will also on this channel we will have our discussion for part four and we're just going to keep going as we just discuss the whole book and then at the end spoilers for the whole cosmere so we'll have lots of discussions and i hope that you'll join us again next week oh cups oh. <laughs>